Are you ready for an open discussion with the best of the best and the best of what's next? Welcome to the Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Join in on a great conversation today with one of the world's great influencers as they showcase the latest tricks and techniques that made them the game changers they are today. Now, here's Tony D'Urso. Welcome to the Spotlight. I'm your host, Tony D'Urso. Today's Spotlight interview is with Leonard Carpenter, the breakout Conan author. The Spotlight focuses on highlighting stars, greats, and game changers. We broadcast every Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific, so please set your calendar to hear from the world's elite. And some breaking news. I'm going on television in the near future with the Tony D'Urso TV show, and I'll be broadcasting over many platforms such as Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Roku, the Voice America TV Network, and others. Together, they have over 100 million monthly viewers. When it goes live, you'll see them on my mobile app at tonydurso.com slash mobile. Download that now and you'll see my other weekly talk shows. And when the TV show comes on, you'll catch it on this app. So please go ahead and download it at tonydurso.com slash mobile. All right. Today we set the stage for the spotlight to chat with Leonard Carpenter, the breakout Conan author. Now, Leonard is well known for his many books on Conan the Barbarian, and he now breaks out of the fantasy market with his historical epic Lusitania Lost, dramatizing the luxury liner sinking that set America on course to enter World War I. Let's find out more about this. Here we go. Welcome to the spotlight, Leonard. Hello, Tony. I'm glad to be on. Hi, Leonard. Thank you so much for joining us. It's our honor. I've seen, of course, the movies on Conan the Barbarian. I actually w- was friends with one of the illustrators, Frank Frazetta, that did some of the artwork on them. So I'm very familiar with that genre. And also, I'm a fiction author. And it therefore, my utmost honor to have you on the spotlight. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, yes. I finally remember those days when the movies were out. I met Frank and uh, had another, several other fine artists doing uh, my paperback, including uh, Boris Vallejo and uh, several other great artists. Oh, yes. I remember seeing them. Absolutely amazing art. Amazing. And Leonard, before we get into that a little more, I would love to know, please, what made you get into the world of writing and becoming an author? Well, when I was very young, I wanted to be a cartoonist. And then when I was able to read, I wanted to be an author. <laughs> so it's been pretty much a uh, long process since then. I, uh, one of the subjects I studied in college was journalism, and that broadened my skills. And since then, after I was, after I had written uh, most of my Conan novels, I went into technical writing, which further uh, reinforced and expanded my writing powers. So I feel fairly accomplished now. Very, very interesting. And I'm very impressed with your career. Again, let's dive into Conan the Barbarian a little bit more. Can you tell us more about it, how it started a little bit more, and how, how it progressed? Well... The original Conan was mainly in the form of short stories published in a magazine called Weird Tales in the 1930s. Uh, The author, Robert E. Howard, who was, even then he was recognized for his very forceful, vivid writing style. He uh, died in 1935, uh, having written only one novel, uh, Conan the Barbarian, pardon me, Conan the Conqueror was the only paperback book that came out long after he died. And uh, then in the 1960s, with the help of uh, a Conan fan and an accomplished author in his own right, El Sprague de Camp, and with major help from Frank Frazetta, whose covers branded Conan for all time, <laughs> the, the cover artist you know, of those original Lancer paperbacks, uh, Conan became a successful literary series and uh, comic books, a uh, newspaper comic strip, and uh, 
movies, toys, cartoons, most every media format. But in writing uh, Conan the Barbarian novels, 11 of them, I've written more words of Conan than any other author, living or dead, including the uh, immortal Robert E. Howard. That's absolutely amazing. And you're right. Just thinking about this subject, the first thing that comes to mind is the Frazetta imagery. It's the first thing. I don't, I don't think of, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger as Conan or, or the other actors that have played him in movies and other films and so forth. I see the Frazetta. It's absolutely amazing that that imagery just sticks with one forever. And if, if you in the audience aren't familiar with Frank Frazetta or the imagery, I invite you to go look up and go search Conan the Barbarian, click on images and just check it out. And some of those images, you're going to say, oh, I've seen that before. I've seen this before. And they stick in the mind forever. And I happen to be the proud owner of maybe a half a dozen Frazettas. So I am very, very happy about that as well. So I guess you can tell I'm a little bit of his fan as well. (laughs) Oh, for sure. Frazetta had classic art training. And uh, that shows up in his work. It's it goes a little beyond a normal book cover type of art uh, with composition and vivid colors, things like that. Also, Conan was the most award winning comic book in history. Uh, It had a long initial run of 20 years or so. And uh, during that time, there was a a fine artist, John Basima, who was uh, doing the uh, Conan comics month in and month out. And his work dovetailed beautifully with the Frazetta originals that had the same spirit, the same vitality. So he deserves credit, too. Yeah, I've seen some of those as well, and I'm familiar. It's very true. Some of them, you're wondering, who was the illustrator on some of them? Because some are kind of close, but they're just way out there. They're stunning and beautiful, each and every one of them. And I'm just... Thank you. And I would love to know any particular story that you'd like to share with us about the Conan days, and then we're going to get into your latest book. The Conans, you know, I I was happy as a clam uh, writing those Conans for years, meanwhile raising a family and holding down a part-time job for backup. I would send... uh, (laughs) copies of each book as it came out to Arnold Schwarzenegger in case he wanted to make another movie. But he got into something that was even bigger, which was The Terminator, <laughs> shortly after that. So, uh, And then, big mistake, he ran for governor. So after, he was pretty much out of the picture at that point. <laughs> yeah, though and, he's, uh, he's come back with many more films since, but I know what you mean. But we don't know that it was a mistake for him or not. I don't know everything he's done as the governor. But he sure has quite an incredible career. And he's did, I believe he did two Conan films. Well, he did two Conans, uh, Conan the Barbarian and Conan the Destroyer. And then he acted in a third Conan-type movie. Was that Sonia the Red Warrior? Red Sonia. Red Sonia. However, he did not use the name Conan in that book. I mean, in that screenplay that was based on the work of Roy Thomas, who was the writer for the also a hugely talented individual who was the writer for the comic books. And he had invented Red Sonia, although uh, Robert E. Howard had powerful women in his stories way back in the 1930s. None of them was a uh, sort of a close companion to Conan, but Red Sonia occurred over and over in the comic books and she's a very memorable name and a very memorable character so uh, she got a movie of her own with a guy who looked a heck of a lot like Conan even though uh, I forget the name he was using at that time that was Arnold of course (laughs) yeah exactly very cool very cool I presume you've met them did you do any cameo in any of those films by the way well no the films were coming out it was good for my books because the films were coming out just when my novels were first coming out. So I, I got a huge bump, you know, Conan was, a you know, became a very popular cultural figure at that time. But uh, none of my books went to film. A couple of them were put into comic book form, 
although they were the stories were too big to uh, fit into one comic book. They had to be serialized. Uh, and uh, Arnold never, uh, yeah, you know, at one point, I say it was a mistake because uh, at one point when he was getting ready to go into politics, he said, well, I'm never going to take off my clothes again for a movie. So that was the end of Conan. Ha <laughs> 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 ha, I'm only kidding. Exactly. He'll be back. Well, very interesting indeed on that. And now if I'm saying it right, I'd like to know about your latest book. And I'm going to say it's Lusitania Lost. Well, I'll, I'll... Most people say Lusitania. L Lusitania, it's the name of the of Portugal in ancient Rome when it when it was a colony of the Roman Empire. But Lusitania was one of two passenger liners that were built. The sister ship was the Mauritania, back in 1907, and they were doing successful transatlantic runs. Lusitania went from New York to Liverpool a hundred times. But uh, in 1915, after the World War I, the Great War broke out, it was still doing passenger and cargo service between New York and Liverpool, and it was sunk by a German U-boat, uh, which is a, a sea disaster that equals in its intensity and fear and tragedy the Titanic sinking just three years before in 1912. And, but it also has huge ramifications in world history because it was, I think, the principal event that started America on track to enter World War I. Now, that is very interesting, Leonard. And probably, like me, many people aren't familiar with all of the events of World War I. Now, the United States was not at war. It was a European war at the time. So... Why would the Germans sink an American vessel to bring them into the war? That doesn't make sense. Well, the Lusitania was beloved by Americans as their uh, favorite cruise ship and one of the fastest to go across the pond, so to speak, the Atlantic Ocean. However, it was a British ship, a Cunard liner, and uh, it was, you know, under orders from the British Admiralty, it had been designated, uh, it had been built to serve as a uh, light cruiser if war broke out, because World War I was anticipated years before it, it happened. And uh, however, it was not armed and converted to a cruiser. It continued on in passenger and cargo service. Uh, and there was a warning from the German embassy that said that uh, all British vessels, including uh, cargo ships and passenger liners, would be at risk from attack by U-boats. However, that warning was delayed in the United States, and it didn't come out until the day before the ships sailed in the newspapers. And so uh, most of the people who had taken passage on the Lusitania and who boarded the ship were probably unaware of it. There was only a uh, one person, to my knowledge, who canceled her booking for that voyage. And uh, she was a psychic, the daughter of a famous psychic. And she claimed to have had a dream that said it, it, it showed a, uh, a ship's uh, passenger cabin. And it said, if you get into that berth, you will never get out, a voice told her. So based on that, she says she canceled her trip to uh, England. This is The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Just ahead, the chat continues with Leonard Carpenter, the breakout Conan author. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. This is the Voice America Influencers Channel. Be inspired. Hi, Tony here with a quick word about getting you discovered. Do you want a lot of people checking out your sales page, your branding page, your podcast? Like many people, are you just trying to do it all yourself? Or maybe get by with a virtual assistant or two? Are you taking webinars, seminars, and workshops to learn how to grow your social media and how to bring visitors to your site? 
Or are you downloading free eBooks, buying books, buying classes, doing this and that just to learn how to get more sales, more people, more exposure? We all do. And it isn't all that it's cracked up to be for some, is it? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It takes a lot of training. I've written books on this and I'm helping others get a lot of visitors to their web pages and podcasts. And I mean thousands and thousands every month. Check it out. Go to tonydierso.com slash grow. That's Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash G-R-O-W. tonydierso.com slash grow. And get discovered. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single-day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. We don't follow. We lead. Join us. The Voice America Influencers Channel. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on The Spotlight. Today's show is with Leonard Carpenter, the breakout Conan author. After 50 years of courtship, travel, and family, With his lost soulmate Cheryl and three children, Leonard Carpenter still travels in adventures, most recently in Cuba, where he brushed up on scuba diving and hiked to Fidel Castro's remote rebel lair in the Sierra Maestra. All right, and now back to the chat with Leonard. This is a British liner. Why did this event pull the U.S. into World War I? Well, there were, there had been a number of British and American uh, ships that had been attacked by submarines. And normally, the uh, crew and passengers had been allowed to abandon ship. But occasionally, there were a U.S. casualty if the ship tried to run away and was struck by gunfire or something. One or two Americans, or in one case, the captain of the ship had a heart attack, and he was an American. That was considered, you know tantamount to an act of war by the central powers, including Germany, against, you know, American freedom of the seas. You know, freedom of the seas had been a huge issue in our history way back to the War of 1912, when, pardon me, 1812, when the British were boarding U.S. cargo ships and uh, commandeering the crew of who they said were British subjects, etc. But anyway... There were 130 American lives lost in the, uh, uh, of the 1,200 people who died, you know, many were American citizens. And uh, so this was a cause for anger and concern in the U.S., and it was also used uh, by people who wanted to get us into the war as, as a, a, a casus belli, a cause for war. But, however, it took two years for the U.S. to uh, arm up and uh, send troops over. Uh, we didn't enter the war until 1917, almost two full years after the sinking of the Lusitania. And there were other causes, such as the Zimmerman telegram, where a German diplomat made an offer to Mexico to uh, give back California 
New Mexico and Arizona to uh, Mexico if they would enter the war against the United States. So that was seen as like the last straw. Oh, I see. Because, at you know, one life is worth everything to me. But here's a case where tens of thousands of people died and were maimed and became crippled as a result of that war in World War One, And it just seems such a staggering amount compared to, you know, one ship. And I don't mean to belittle it at all. It's just quite something because so many more were hurt in this cause. And it, it's sad. War never makes sense. So I guess that's just where we're going to leave that one. Well, war never makes sense. And there's always some question about what got us in in the first place, whether it's the Spanish-American War, the sinking of the U.S. Maine, you know, the explosion in Havana Harbor in uh, 1900 that got us into the Spanish-American War, and it netted us uh, some very rich colonies of Puerto Rico and Cuba and the Philippines. And then, uh, you know, there are questions about every war since then, too. And this book of course, the passengers, uh, the story that I've told, it's, uh, it's similar in a way to the movie Titanic in that uh, uh, it adheres very closely to the actual historical events of that final fatal week, the seven-day voyage to the South Irish coast where the ship was sunk. Uh, however, uh, I've added half a dozen characters who have their own... Uh, stories and their own romances going on, well, or more like a dozen. Five of them are nurses who are heading off to the, uh, to the battlefront in the Great War to, uh, you know, help alleviate the suffering. And one of those nurses is, is uh, almost masquerading, and she's traveling under a false name, and she's on the run from a New York mob boss who has his gangsters out looking for her. So she goes right out of the frying pan into the fire, so to speak. But at first, you know, it's uh, just another ocean cruise. And uh, she runs into a reporter who is uh, sort of a romantic hero. And he's on his way to be a war correspondent for a New York paper. But on the way, he's interested in finding out what secret weapons may be hidden in the hold of the Lusitania passenger liner. I see. Now, as I understand it, this is basically a true story with fictional characters in for, you know, to make the storyline interesting and to give it some depth. But well, the, the characters make the story interesting, uh, but they also bring out basic facts. There are so many mysteries about the sinking of the Lusitania, which have been debated over the years, and some of them may never even be fully known since the ship is in very poor condition. It's at 300 feet deep. It's crumbling, collapsing, and sinking into the mud of the Irish Sea. The Irish, Ch and so uh What are some of those mysteries, please? And also, if we're able to send diving robots, forgive me for the word, diving aquatic vessels that are totally computer manned, can't they do the same to go look at the Lusitania? down there only 300 feet? Yes, well, the divers can go down there, but they're very limited in the time they can spend down there. And uh, there have been a lot of dives. In 2015, I went to Ireland to go to the cent centenary, the 100th uh, centennial of the uh, Lusitania sinking. And I met the owner of the Lusitania wreck, who is a, an Arizona millionaire and a very experienced diver. And he's been down to the ship with others. And uh, they have found that there definitely was rifle and artillery ammunition aboard the ship, as is shown in the original cargo manifest. However, you know, the original cargo manifest of the Lusitania, the ship sailed based on a temporary manifest, which didn't list all the contents. And uh, when the ship went down, President Woodrow Wilson took the final manifest, which listed all the ammunition, and he put it, he locked it in a drawer 
in the presidential desk. And there it remained until the 1940s when President Franklin D. Roosevelt, it, uh, it was brought to his attention that he might want to know, you know, what the cargo of the Lusitania was when it was sunk by the German U-boat, because we were getting into a similar situation of the U.S. aiding Britain when we were not at war yet in 1940, 41. So uh, that, that's one of the many secrets that has gradually come to light. The U.S. was sending arms and munitions to Britain for the World War I. Well, it was a very profitable arms trade. Now, theoretically, in World War I, we would have also been supplying uh, Germany and Austria with arms. However, those countries are almost landlocked, and Britain controlled the sea access to Germany. So, therefore, if we wanted to sell, you know, if we wanted to be Daddy Warbucks and uh, sell arms for the Great War, we had to pretty much sell them to Britain. And even if we tried to send them to Germany, they would have, we would have been stopped and searched and uh, the cargoes would have been confiscated or most likely purchased by the British on their way to Germany. So, uh, you know, it was, uh, the British had a, had a functional, a naval blockade of Germany, which was one of the things that caused hardship and brought the war to an end. The fact that they were, there was literally starvation by the end of the war in Germany because uh, they couldn't import foodstuffs. And uh, of course, all their production was going into war material. But uh, at the same time, Germany tried to put a stranglehold, a submarine blockade of Britain, so that any ship that tried to sail into British waters could be sunk by a German U-boat or else, you know, if not by surface raiders or by uh, sea mines or by uh, aircraft or zeppelins, uh, the, the other new terrible weapons which been had been invented for that war. But the most effective was the submarine torpedo, which could be launched from beneath the surface without warning. So in, what happened in 1915 when the Lusitania went down was pretty much they stopped they wouldn't the submarine would not surface and command the ship to stop and then send uh, a boarding crew to ins inspect the cargo anything like that they would just set off a couple of torpedoes toward this vessel without even surfacing and very likely that would be the, one or two torpedoes would be enough to sink any cargo ship this is the spotlight with tony dierso just ahead we're going to find out more from Leonard Carpenter, the breakout Conan author. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. Change starts here. Change starts now. Join us, the Voice America Influencers Channel. Hey guys, Tony Dierso here, and I have to say thank you. Thanks a million. A million downloads, that is. Go to TonyDurso.com slash TV and read all about the exciting next adventure we have in store for you. That's TonyDurso.com slash TV. And once again, thanks a million. Listen for In the Limelight with Clarissa Burt, international media celebrity, supermodel, and renowned beauty and lifestyle expert, as well as founder and CEO of Envelop Her, multimedia platform for women, and sought-after inspirational speaker on women's issues. You'll connect with Clarissa's super influencer celebrity friends and experts as they speak about health, wealth, beauty, lifestyle, business, the love of giving, and the love of living a model life. Tune in every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel. The future of online TV is here. View exclusive content from your favorite talk radio hosts and new programs that you can't see anywhere else. Visit voiceamerica.tv today. Hear the stories. Be motivated. Be inspired. Join us today. Voice America Influencers. Influencers. 
listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on The Spotlight. Today's show is with Leonard Carpenter, the breakout Conan author. Another great book by Leonard is Biohacker. Leonard says the original title was Fatal Strain, but that sounded a little too fatalistic. He continues saying the underlying theme was that human overpopulation represented an ever-increasing strain that could prove fatal to our own planetary survival and Earth's biosphere. Still true and becoming more evident day after day. End quote. More info on Biohacker at leonardcarpenter.com. All right, back to the chat with Leonard. And is it true, Leonard, from what I can remember a little bit of the history, the German U-boat sent one torpedo, yet there were two separate and distinct explosions on the Lusitania? Yeah, that appears to be true. The the best, it's pretty well acknowledged that there was only one torpedo, but people even who were on the shore on a golf course in Ireland who could see the ship could see that there were two explosions with only a matter of seconds in between the two, but they were two distinct explosions, which suggests that uh, the second one may have been what they call a secondary explosion, which occurs when uh, armament strikes a uh, fuel depot or an arms cache, you know, then the ammo that's stored there will go off. Then the coal, you know, it, it wasn't a coal explosion. Coal doesn't explode like that. It's been argued that it might have been a coal dust explosion or it might have been a steam explosion. And, and there have been uh, television movies or uh, documentaries that tried to explore what was the cause of that secondary explosion. But the most likely one, it appears to the the fact that the uh, torpedo struck right near the front of the vessel where the cargo hold was located suggests very strongly that it was ammunition. It's also believed that there were uh, bales of gun cotton which uh, reacts with seawater. Uh, so it's possible that just the flooding of the hold would have ignited gun cotton, which would have been a quick, massive explosion to uh, further damage the ship. And the result was that uh, in spite of the fact that it was a huge ship and it was, appears to have been struck by only one torpedo, it sank in 18 minutes. That's which, fast for a large vessel. Ah uh, yes, it's uh, you know this has been the uh, the elephant in the living room for many years. You know uh, why did it go down so fast? At first, there was an allegation that two torpedoes were fired, but the historians uh, seem to now agree that there was a single torpedo. And uh, you know there are also th- things that are still secret. It's believed, but it can't be established for certain that the war diary of uh, Captain Walter Schwieger, the captain of the U-boat, was altered toward the end of the war uh, because the two pages that describe the sinking of the Lusitania uh, are not signed by the captain and they appear you know, in a slightly different format than the rest of the, of the, of the law, the war diary. And it's also believed that the... Uh, it, when when the sinking was investigated by tribunals in the U.S. and in Britain, that the uh, logs of the germ of the British radio stations that were monitoring uh, and sending, you know, warnings and signals to the sea vessels were also altered to uh, obscure, you know, what the what precise orders the captain of the ship was under. So these are all very rich fields of inquiry that are lively controversies even today, and they are investigated in detail in my book. But the, the main thrust of the book is the in, intense drama of this uh, ill-fated voyage and the, uh, the things 
both real and fictional, though, that were going on aboard the ship to try to just to stay alive in this. Once they entered the war zone, you know, there was a very palpable sense of fear aboard the ship. And uh, then once, of course, once the attack took place, then it was panic and chaos, which uh, makes for a drama that's every bit as gripping and arresting as the great movie Titanic. Leonard, as you've researched this so thoroughly and wrote about it, you're in a way an authority on this. Why do you think these falsifications and diary was changed and the news report was changed and the findings were changed? Have you, do you have any conjectures or do you have some, you know, great, great suspicions, you know, that you may not be able to prove, but everything points down a certain way? Tell me more what you think about this. Well, uh, recently we've had a couple of Oscar winning figure uh, movies that portrayed a uh, very famous historical figure, one of the great men of the century, the last century, Winston Churchill. But in 1915, Winston Churchill was first Lord of the Admiralty. And uh, the month after the Lusitania sank, he resigned from that position, not necessarily because of the Lusitania, because he was always also being held accountable for the Gallipoli invasion of Turkey, which was another you know, famous movie uh, a few years back, uh, which was considered a failure, you know, the whole mission of invading the uh, soft underbelly of Europe turned out to be a very costly mistake. But uh, there's a quote from Winston Churchill, looking back, you know, as they say, the winners write the history. And looking back, uh, Winston Churchill says, in spite of all its horror, we must regard the sinking of the Lusitania as an event most important and favorable to the Allies. Can you translate well, that? Well, he's, he's pointing out a simple fact that the loss of the Lusitania was a huge propaganda loss for Germany, and it was a big factor in bringing the United States into the war. And so uh, the, the question of, uh, you know, no one has complete control in a situation. If, if the torpedo had struck that ship anywhere else, it might have only crippled the ship. The ship might have been able to limp into uh, the into uh, the port of Queenstown, which was less than 20 miles away. There may have been even no lives lost, but an attack on that ship would have still offended the American public and looked like an act of war. As, but as it is, as luck, bad luck, and history will have it, that single torpedo sent her to the bottom with a loss of 1,200 lives of the 2,000 or so people that were on board. And so uh, it was a dreadful tragedy, but it certainly <laughs> served the purpose of putting the United States on a war footing, at least our leaders in Washington. And uh, even before the voyage, our Secretary of State, who was advocating strongly for peace, uh, William Cullen Bryant, he resigned from President Wilson's cabinet because uh, he didn't like the way things were going toward the U.S. entry into the war. And that was, you know, more than two years before we actually entered. I see. Leonard, I know somewhere you make some references, analogies, comparisons with the Titanic. Very different circumstances. One had to do with the war and a U-boat and a torpedo. The other didn't. Yet you made some interesting comparisons. Could you share some of that with us? Oh yeah, Well, the main comparison is in uh, <laughs> the type of story that I'm telling. Because I was, you know, I, I think that uh, the ti Titanic film is, uh, it was the most costly movie ever made at the time. It was also the most profitable. And uh, it's a great classic. And... Uh, it was my late wife, Cheryl. She passed away four years ago, but she bought me a history of the Lusitania and she, uh, as a birthday present, and she uh, wrote in the title page, I hope this inspires you. <laughs> and it certainly did, because she and I both could see the parallels and the, and the uh, dramatic potential of the two stories. And so I have actually 
completed a 120-page screenplay of this novel. The, my working title is The Lucy, since so many people you know, don't know what the Lusitania is. It hasn't been popular and kept alive over the years as the Titanic has. But uh, I've got the screenplay uh, complete. It's online, accessible to film producers. And if someone wants to uh, invest, you know, a few hundred million dollars to make the movie, it could be even somewhat cheaper than uh, Titanic with modern techniques of digital animation. It's out there. In other words, well, it cost me thousands of dollars to learn to write a screenplay and to get it translated, you know, into a screen format. The storytelling demands are quite different. But to me, that's an investment in the future because it seems to me that eventually this book has to be a bestseller and this movie has to be made. And I hope I'm there with the firstest with the mostest as an investment. Me too. I hope I walk the red carpet when your movie premieres. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll try, to, I'll try to get you in on that, Tony. <laughs> Sounds good. This is The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Just ahead, Leonard shares more insights and his contact info. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. This is the Voice America Influencers Channel. Be inspired. Hi, Tony here with a quick word about getting you discovered. Do you want a lot of people checking out your sales page, your branding page, your podcast? Like many people, are you just trying to do it all yourself? Or maybe get by with a virtual assistant or two? Are you taking webinars, seminars, and workshops to learn how to grow your social media and how to bring visitors to your site? Or are you downloading free ebooks, buying books, buying classes, doing this and that just to learn how to get more sales, more people, more exposure? We all do. And it isn't all that it's cracked up to be for some, is it? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It takes a lot of training. I've written books on this and I'm helping others get a lot of visitors to their web pages and podcasts. And I mean thousands and thousands every month. Check it out. Go to TonyDierso.com slash grow. That's Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash G-R-O-W. TonyDierso.com slash grow. And get discovered. Do you believe that being fit is difficult? Do you think it requires turning in your favorite comfort foods for boring chicken and broccoli and spending hours in a gym? It doesn't. Tune into Have It All with Devin Alexander. Devin and her guest experts will show you how you can have it all at any age, from relationships to money to thinking bigger than you've ever imagined. Devin will fast-track your goals to yummy reality. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and 12 noon Eastern Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel. Have you had a chance to check out Voice America's online magazine and blog, Press Pass? If you love our hosts and shows, check out articles that give an even deeper perspective. Plus, topics about health and fitness, movie reviews, philosophy, business tips and tactics, spirituality, positive thought, current events, and even more about your favorite host. It's just a click away at VAPressPass.com. That's VAPressPass.com. VA Press Pass by Voice America. All access, all the time. We don't follow, we lead. Join us, the Voice America Influencers Channel. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on the Spotlight. Today's show is with Leonard Carpenter, the breakout Conan author. Another great book by Leonard is The Stravinsky Code, which has been free on his website for a short while. Leonard is taking it offline any day now and says it will be available later this year in the magazine Weird Book. Information and links on this book are at his site, leonardcarpenter.com. And now back to the chat. Where can we buy the book right now? 
go to Amazon, any other place? It, it's available on Amazon, also on Barnes & Noble for Nook and on uh, other uh, web pages. But uh, it's also in bookstores. If you go into any bookstore in the, in the U.S., uh, if it's not on the shelf already, they can order it for you. But Amazon.com, Leonard Carpenter, Lusitania Lost is the title, and that'll get you there almost instantaneously. All right, you heard that, the Spotlight audience. Please go to Amazon and get your copy of Lusitania Lost. It's a riveting book written by none other than the world-famous author of Conan, the Barbarian series. Get a copy of this book, and if you want to see it in in a movie, write your local congressman, that's a joke, write your local TV producer and say, let's get this into a movie. I want to see this into a movie. I really like this subject. Okay, let me mention that my own website, leonardcarpenter.com, that's L-E-O-N-A-R-D-C-A-R-P-E-N-T-E-R. It has links to uh, the Amazon and the other uh, distributors, and it also has uh, relevant, some of those blogs you mentioned that compare the Lusitania and the Titanic sinkings. And uh, also there's an announcement which... uh, was only this week I managed to get get it up just before uh, our interview. My short fiction will be available on uh, the website to to be read right there on the website. And uh, the first story that's up there. Well, let me say that these stories are not heroic fantasy Conan type stories in a fictional Hyborian age. Most of them are in the modern day and that they take place in everyday life. So they're accessible to all readers, like the, uh, the Lusitania story, you know, should be enjoyed by anyone who's seen the Titanic movie. But the story that's up there now, uh, and don't laugh, it's titled The Stravinsky Code. I like it. <laughs> and it, yeah. does, it does make me laugh, and I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can... Uh, you can imagine that it's a lighthearted takeoff on Dan Brown's great books, you know, The Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons, etc. But this is only a 6,000-word short story, uh, so it's light reading. But uh, it takes off, you know, from uh, everyday life, and it goes into a little bit of surprise and fantasy toward the end. But uh, I'm going to be putting other stories that I've written over the years on the website, and I'm afraid the Stravinsky code won't be up there for long because a publisher, uh, the publisher of Weird Book magazine, which is a real print magazine that is mailed out uh, or even sold on some newsstands, he read the story and he wants to put it in his magazine, so I'll have to be pulling it down later this week. I'll have to put another one up in its place. But I have a dozen or more stories that I can put out there, and I will uh, be putting up, and I'll be leaving up these stories every week or so, uh, so there will be plenty of good reading on my website. And the website, as I say, also has the links to buy the Lusitania Lost historical novel, and it also has the blogs that I've written on the background, And it also uh, has links to another novel that I have on. It's called Biohacker, which is a near future uh, medical thriller that's available only on Amazon. So uh, there's a lot. Oh, and what what also is on my website or on uh, YouTube are two background videos that I have made about the Lusitania about the book and the historical sinking. And one of them shows some of the different covers that I've conceived for the book over the years when I was trying to complete it and sell it. The novel only came out last November from Mango Publications. So right now for me, it's a, it's a big push to uh, promote this book and get it up to uh, the level where it'll start to be looked at for movie or television media. Totally get it, and very, very exciting. Fascinating subject. 
And you've mentioned about some of your other stories. And I would like to know, what does the future hold for you? Where do you see yourself going with some of these? or And what are some of your, your future plans on this? Well, you know, the Lusitania is a very important story. It's not just enjoyable and thrilling, but it's also, uh, a, you know, a piece of history. It's a historical treasure trove, really, uh, with its impact on world history of the last century. And uh, I'd like to see that that book be, you know, a bestseller. I'd also like to uh, reissue the uh, biohacker novel, which is about Earth, the near future of our planet, and it addresses issues like population and climate change. And uh, the book that I'm currently writing, it's a fiction novel about, uh, it incorporates a lot of uh, knowledge and travel experience from Cuba. It's a quest for the fountain, day, fountain of youth in modern day Cuba. And uh, the working title is Fountain of You. <laughs> and so I'm more than halfway through that book, and I'm hoping that by the time the Lusitania novel is well launched with a wide readership, they'll be ready for that one, which is uh, just, you know, very interesting and informative story with fictional characters on a uh, slightly fantastic quest. That's a very fascinating subject. Also, Leonard, what I seem to recall with Ponce de Leon from my Spanish history in America, he was in search of a fountain of youth in the Caribbean. Yes, well, of course, we have to remember that back in the days of Ponce de Leon, as the Spanish say, they didn't know they were in uh, the New World. They thought they were on the fringe of Asia. <laughs> and there were stories from Asia of Shangri-La or a fountain of youth somewhere in the Himalayas, someplace like that. And uh, so that's the kind of thing, besides gold and colonies, they were also looking for uh, eternal life here in the New World. And the rumors placed it in Florida. But Ponce de Leon actually died in Cuba because uh, he was attacked on the southeast coast of Flo southwest coast of Florida by uh, indigenous tribes, and uh, he was w injured. And uh, when they put to sea, he didn't want to be nursing his wound on a rocking boat, I can imagine. So he took off to the nearest port 90 miles away, which was Havana. And uh, it's arguable that possibly there was some kind of healing fountain or something in Cuba that he knew about that he was trying to get to. We can never be sure. Or it's also possible that, you know, the stories of a fountain of youth were just tall tales, you know, sensational rumors that were spread to uh, get a, uh, people who wanted to be bestsellers of the day or to attract colonists to the new world. But... Uh, that's very interesting, and I look forward to reading that book when you come out, because I'm sure you're going to do a lot of research on that. And I believe even though rumors, you know, they get twisted, there's lies, there's things that aren't true, somewhere something true, it started or germinated from something. And so it's always very interesting where a rumor <laughs> comes from and how it became a rumor. But I know you're going to research this quite well and tell us some about it. Well, I've, I've researched it extensively already on a half a dozen trips to Cuba. And uh, I, there's a, a wealth of information. Of course, going to Cuba one year ago was a huge popular fad, a topic, you know, because the, it had just opened up. And now uh, with some of the travel restrictions that have been placed, once again, it it's a lot tougher. Of course, if I go there, I'm going on business, you know, to research this novel, which is more than half completed. But uh, I don't have any plans in the near future. But I think someday, you know, people will be able to travel down there once again, and this book could come in handy. I like that a lot. And Leonard, we may have some aspiring authors and writers out here in the Spotlight audience. What advice could you give to them, those that, you know, want to move on in this profession? 
Can you give them some motivation and stimulation on this? Well, the hardest thing when you're setting out as a writer is uh, to settle your mind and uh, to overcome the blank page. You know, if you if you're sitting there trying to write and you've got a blank page to to start to fill and you don't have a clear idea of how to go about it or you don't have a project already underway you might sit there for a couple of hours and be totally frustrated and give up that's not enough you've got to give yourself a huge block of time like maybe six hours without interruptions before you can start to fill in that blankness and uh, so and you know with my, uh, modern life the pace of modern life it's not easy to set aside that time. but uh, So that's the initial stumbling block. Now, after that, there's a trick that I have, which is techno technology-wise, it's possible now. My best time writing is when I first wake up in the morning. So I keep a laptop beside my bed. And when I, when I started this, I was married, of course. And I didn't have the advantage, but later on, I found when when the uh, during my marriage, you know, when when laptops became available, you can type on them very silently. So you could actually be writing at 5 a.m. with your spouse asleep in the bed beside you, and she might not even know or wake up. You see what I mean? But the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I reach down beside the bed and I drag the laptop up and I go over what I've written the day before and that gets me moving on the next portion. And that's before there is any radio, TV, phone calls. It's be even before the pets have woken up. <laughs> so there's literally no interruption and I might get two or three hours of writing done before it's time to start my day. I like that. Very good advice. And yeah, you're very fresh and clean in the morning. And I totally understand that many times I'll get up in the middle of the night just to do work or to write something. And it's that quiet time. It's quite magical in a way because there's nothing else distracting you. So thank you for that advice. I like that. Yeah. And lastly, Leonard, is there any contact information? Would you know, can our audience get a hold of you? Can they go to leonardcarpenter.com and send you a message? Yes, it's possible to comment on my blogs or just send me a, a personal message. And uh, my email may even be on there. But th that's uh, the most direct way, I think, to get through to me. Uh, if, if, well, if anybody reads one of my stories and has critical comments or uh, praise or flattery is okay, too. Uh, we all like uh, that. <laughs> yeah, that's available. LeonardCarpenter.com. All right. Well, as a, as a fellow writer who's received nowhere near the stature of what you have, again, I tip my hat, and it is such an honor to do this interview with you. Leonard Carpenter, thank you so much for sharing, sharing about wow. your Conan the Barbarian, the Lusitania Lost, and all your other great works. Thank you so much for sharing this with us, Leonard. I really just love it. I thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Tony. Great. And to our Spotlight audience, thank you very much. It's our honor to have you listen. All right. Keep your focus on success, and I'll see you next on the Spotlight. We hope you've enjoyed this week's edition of the Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Be sure to tune in again next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel. Now, enjoy the weekend.